Would you please welcome Eric Johnson. I taught art and design here for 36 plus years and uh, retired a couple years ago, but I started this project long before that. Uh, as you can see, I'm going to be talking about Ernest Flock's photography, which was a serious hobby, very serious hobby, but it was a hobby. He was a composer. But I'd like to introduce it and let, let a four minute video introduce not only his photography, but it's the sacred service, which you'll be going to on Sunday. I'll see if I can get that. Born in Switzerland in 1880, Ernest Bloch was a rare artistic spirit, a larger-than-life figure who created some of the world's finest music during the first half of the 20th century. He was also an accomplished photographer who documented key passages in his life's journey. Early years of violin and composition study throughout Europe, the growth of his three children and family his arrival in New York City in 1916, and his subsequent travels throughout the country as an increasingly celebrated teacher and composer. In 1930, five years after becoming a naturalized citizen, Bloch received a commission from San Francisco's Temple Emmanuel. They came up with the idea of something that had never been done before, something that had never been done with any success before, which was to treat the liturgy, the Hebrew liturgy, on the one hand, for worship, in this case, for reform worship, but at one and the same time to transcend that and be a universal work of art. Bloch retreated to the village of Ticino in his native Switzerland and began composing Avodat HaKodesh, or Sacred Service, a complete Sabbath morning reform service for baritone cantor with full choir and orchestra. During this time, he drew inspiration from the beauty of the land and from some of its poorest local inhabitants. For Bloch, it was a time to reflect deeply on the connectedness of all life and on his own spiritualism as expressed through this very personal work. It far surpasses a Jewish service now, he would write. It has become a cosmic poem, a glorification of the laws of the universe. After three years spent composing his service, it was clear that Bloch had succeeded in doing for the Jewish liturgy what Mozart and Bach had achieved in their masterpieces of Christian worship. In that sense, the Bloch service was accomplished. And to this day, many fine composers have followed that model in different styles. But the most famous one remains the Bloch service. Ernest Bloch eventually moved to Oregon, where he died in 1959. A year later, in his memory, the New York Philharmonic performed the sacred service under the baton of Leonard Bernstein. Singing the part of the baritone cantor was another New York music luminary, Metropolitan Opera star Robert Merrill. 39 years later, in an oral history with the Milken Archive, Merrill would recall the experience of bringing this work to life. Lenny wrote something in my score which I treasure. He says, Bob Merrill, you were born to sing this part. I was so thrilled. I recorded about 40 albums in my lifetime, and all I, but this is one of my favorites. I put it on periodically just to listen. says a lot. It gives you a little on the sacred service. It gives you a series of photographs. Uh, I know we'll go into a little deeper into the photography of Ernest Block now. You've gotten a little taste there. And of course, the music is really what, it's up, what brings us here today. Uh, the photography is his hobby, remember. He's a composer. 
Uh, well, I'll go ahead and start at the beginning. Uh, very briefly, I was given access to the Ernest Bloch Photography Archive by his children in 1970. Okay, I was 21. Uh, and I was an undergrad at the University of Oregon. He, gave, he retired the last 20 years of his life in Oregon, so that makes the connection there. I went through over 5,000 negatives, all types of sizes and shapes, edited and printed, listened to his music, looked at his library, read his notes, talked extensively with his daughter, Lucien, who was the one I spent my time with uh, down in the uh, Mendocino Coast area. Uh, I'll go into that in greater detail, but let's go ahead and get into Ernest Bloch's uh, you know, life in, the, in photography. So you might say, hold on, who took these pictures? He did. He had a little mechanical delay on his camera. He would mm -hmm. run it and take self-portraits. He's got hundreds of self-portraits. <laughs> so uh, he's documenting the, his life, and uh, perhaps you get a little bit sense of his uh, sense of uh, self-worth there. It's pretty high. <laughs> Uh, here he is as a violin student, as mentioned back in the video, I was a composition student in Frankfurt with uh, Ivan Noor, some of you musicians may know him. He also studied with Eugene Isai, a great violinist of the early part of the 20th century. Some musician, musicians will know, will know his name. So he studied violin and composition. He went starting at 17, 18, 19, 20 years old. He was born in 1880, so we're right at the turn of the century. But his passion was hiking Swiss uh, and they hike, and he really was out there going as a kind of a relief from his composing, I suppose you could say, and being in the mountains and the Alps. Uh, he grew up in Geneva, remember, so uh, you know, it makes all the sense in the world. But the people he loved more than anybody, but beyond his own family, were the peasants, people close to the land, the farmers, the peasants. Uh, and so he would take self portraits with them, and there he is. You can see how happy he is. What is this, 1909? So he's, what, 28, 29 years old. Here, a wonderful self portrait. Again, self portrait with a family of farmers. <coughs> His son actually is in the second from the right on the lower uh, uh, row there. But just what a delightful portrait of a simple, authentic people that he was so attracted to. <coughs> Uh, getting back to his music, however, uh, which is really what brings us here, as I said, Debussy is really important. The musicians will imagine that Bloch uh, had some connection to Debussy. He met Debussy in 1903 in Paris. Uh, Bloch was around various cities in Europe uh, uh, to being, you know, being a student. And in a very, in a nutshell, beyond a nutshell, uh, so I apologize to the musicians in the room, uh, Debussy represents the modern future of music at the time. His groundbreaking prelude to the afternoon of a fawn. This is the. This is a man with goat legs now, not a deer. Uh, <laughs> mythological figure, I think, right? Uh, uh, focused purely on the evoc uh, evocation of mood. It was inspired by a poem of a, a French symbolist poet. We don't need to go into details there. The key word is synesthesia. Some of you are familiar with it, perhaps, that connection between the senses. And uh, ability, you might call it the ability to see something with one sense and feel it with another. This connection between the senses. And Debussy is certainly a pioneer in use of, uh, the use of orchestral color to generate mood and syn synesthetic expression is a hallmark of WC. So if you've never listened to the, the uh, piece, A Prelude to the Afternoon of a Fawn, uh, please do. Close your eyes. What is it, 10, 12 minutes? Some of you know. Uh, it's really quite an experience. And that's it. Most people would argue I think that's a revolutionary piece of music. And certainly it was the cutting edge, if you will, of what Bloch was experiencing as a 23-year-old when he met WC in 1903. Uh, but as we move along through Bloch's you know, early life in, in Switzerland, he himself becomes a teacher, a lecturer at the Cleveland, uh, pardon me, Cleveland, that comes later, at the uh, Geneva Conservatory. Uh, and in fact, up to the, uh, by the time he leaves uh, Europe in 20, 1916, he's given over 100 lectures on everything from the soul of art to, uh, you know, Bach, Beethoven, uh, med medieval music, and on and on and on. So he has a, he's ex has extensive teaching experience by the time he leaves Europe. I should add one more thing, though, and I think Tom would, uh, uh, we've had some conversations about this, and that's one of the, his composition uh, teachers, his name, a fellow by the name of Jacques Dalcroze, 
who developed a method of teaching music using body movement, connection to the learning of music. Body, body gesture, the people here that explain that a lot better than I can, but that connected, again, connecting the senses, if you will. So there's uh, something called eurythmics, which is a term that is associated with Del Crow's teaching methods, and Bloch himself employed that method. Well, his family, though, his growing family, young, and then growing, getting, you know, you can see here, just two years apart, they're getting a little bit, you can see that pathway, this is a, he lived in a big home uh, right outside of Geneva, in a little, what we call now a, a suburb, suburb of Geneva, I suppose, Satigny, and there is a uh, wife, children, and mother, and then on, the, on your right, he, he is wife and three children. Lucienne, the young little girl there, is the one that I got to know when she was in her 70s. More pictures of his children and self-portrait with his children. Really, you know, for you, the few photographers that are here, the, the quality of what he did, these are all four by five inch glass and then eventually film for your photographers. He's very carefully done. I mean, he's meticulous. Uh, he's a hobby, but he's very meticulous about it. Developing and making little contact prints, putting them in albums, no enlargements. But boy, was he careful, really wonderful. And here, the peasants, the peasant of all peasants here. Uh, you can see, if you, if you uh, recall that pathway that he took the pictures of his family, that same pathway, one day, a woman comes up selling mushrooms. And this is the famous mushroom lady. Here she is from 1912, coming right up to sell mushrooms. Uh, Lucienne remembers her, she was only, I think, four years old during this, at this time, but she remembers how she smelled, so that's uh, <laughs> uh, But hey, we can't smell. It's, it's really a remarkable picture, frontal, just present, presenting to you, really, really timeless in its own way, but also this connection to the authenticity of the, the peasants and people close to the land that's really a hallmark of, of his, um, uh, of an aspect of Ernest Bloch's photography. Okay. 1916, right before going to coming to America, he composes Shalomo, the great cello rhapsody. Uh, many of you musicians are familiar with it, of course. Uh, and the, this on your right is the cellist who he worked with, passing notation back and forth. Alexander Bajamsky, who was at that time, a rel I think a relatively, maybe quite well-known cellist, and his wife Katya Bajamsky. This is in Geneva. And, but this is right before he leaves. And of course, what's happening in 1916? War. Uh, I think you even have uh, Germans invading Verdun, if I my memory of World War I history is anywhere close to correct. So uh, also financial, di financial difficulties led him to uh, America, 1916. Comes to New York. Wow, does he take pictures of New York? In the harbor, in the city, in crowds. Here he is with his camera, by the way, which is kind of helpful to see. He seems quite enthusiastic. And uh, he was enthusiastic. He was taking pictures of his new world in New York. He was actually had the opportunity to come to New York because of a uh, a job opportunity, basically being a conductor for a small orchestra that was accompanying a dancer by the name of Maud Allen. You see her there. Uh, that lasted three months or so, and kind of the, the program of uh, the uh, tour collapsed, financial difficulties. But by then, he had met some people that opened up other doors for him in New York, specifically Waldo Frank, and you'll learn a little bit more about him. This is now Lucien's recollection to me. Uh, he says in a letter, he mentions Waldo Frank at the time I met, I'm reading this, this is his daughter reading this, he's not sure, he's not met Alfred Stieglitz yet, uh, but he was introduced by Waldo Frank. So these are letters of introduction that he received and people who began to meet in New York that opened up uh, really everything to him. In fact, Waldo Frank was so enthusiastic about Ernest Bloch's music <coughs> at this point that he invited him to write an article about music, literally titled Man and Music, okay, uh, in 1917. And you can see he published in 19 in the article, Bach presents his beliefs regarding music, art, and the importance of expressing the soul. You'll hear some of that in a cello piece here from Andrew in a few minutes. He contrasts that with the mechanical perfection and mechanical invention. So there's a, he sees as 
I'll read a few of these words. I don't want to just be reading to you, but he did, these are kind of key to understanding what happens with Ernest Bach's photography. And he writes, this is now about music. Serious composers persist in the obsession with technique and procedure. They discuss and argue. They laboriously create their arbitrary brain beyond works of the <laughs> emotional element. The soul of art. Okay, that's Bach right there. Is lost in a passion for mechanical perfection. Art is the outlet of the mystical, emotional needs of the human spirit. It is created rather by instinct than by intelligence, rather than rather by intuition than by will. And I won't read the rest of it, but he refers to mechanical inventions which kind of get in the way of the soul, basically. Uh, so, meanwhile, he's a passion photographer. But, he, as you'll see in a minute, he argues the case that photography is not an art to Stieglitz. Not an art to Stieglitz. Okay. First of all, let's introduce who Alfred Stieglitz is a little bit. Alfred Stieglitz, uh, in a nutshell, played a seminal role in the development of art photography, recognized as an art form and the dissemination of modern art in the United States, those two things. Photography as an art and the dissemination of modern art in the United States, uh, in the teens and the 20s especially. Uh, just by way of an example, you know, on the upper left you might see what would be called pictorial photography at the time, 1890, a field, a hazy landscape, uh, really mimicking uh, popular painting of the time, kind of uh, evocative, uh, soft and very painterly looking. Stieglitz comes along in 1907 and, and starts paying attention to the life before him, the train station, the billowing smoke, literally titling it the hand of man in 1907. So he's saying no, photography needs to define itself on its own terms. And he continue, continues to do that in, the, in the, the city of New York. You can see these two here. I don't need to read the titles, you can read them yourself. But you can see he's really exploring uh, the life that's being that's changing in front of him. So he's a photographer that's pushing the boundaries at that time of what's been done with the camera. In addition, he's, a, he's exhibiting work that he, uh, some of his colleagues are bringing over from Europe, specifically people by the name of Picasso, Matisse, Rodin. Their first exhibitions in America were in Stieglitz's gallery. Uh, so Stieglitz really plays a huge role in disseminating modern art, if you will. Some people might call it more abstracted art. Uh, certainly Picasso is somewhat abstract, to say the least. Uh, there's a drawing of uh, a, what is that, a wine glass at the table on there on the lower left, uh, which Stieglitz bought, actually. But, but time doesn't allow us to go into the detail there. But uh, so important, important uh, role that Stieglitz had there in addition to his photography. So, Let's get to George O'Keefe. George O'Keefe, who, how many people recognize the name George O'Keefe? All hands raised, okay. Uh, more than Stieglitz at this point, I would say. Uh, so O'Keefe really transcended him uh, in the last 40 years of her, of her career. Uh, here she is early on though, 1916, 17. She comes to New York from Texas. Uh, she drops her drawings off uh, to Stieglitz's gallery to see what his feedback might be. Uh, he takes down his show, puts her work up, and says, in a nutshell, says, at last a woman on paper. And that's Stieglitz, that's what he said. Now I'm overly simplifying you photo people, I, bear with me here. Uh, I, I, uh, but I'm, I'm overly simplifying. But that's it, in a nutshell. So he sees something in, in, in O'Keefe. In fact, O'Keefe, which was also something that's being explored at the time, and that's this synesthesia coming now in, in New York. And, and the artist, and specifically O'Keefe, here painting music pink and blue, blue and green music. So we're seeing it again, the synesthesia between the media and, the, and sensations. I mean, can you see music when you look at these? Well, compare them. There's, there's kind of water kind of uh, floating elements and uh, hard-edged elements. I mean, can you let your imagination go and you can see maybe at least what she's working with here. This, in a parallel, paralleling uh, visual art and color to, to music. There's been a history here as well, which I don't have time to go into, but some of you will know the, the name Kandinsky and this high concept of synesthesia and seeing images uh, when you hear music. 
most people will recognize this wonderful painting by uh, this blown up black iris that's about this large, the painting and things like that, uh, uh, by uh, O'Keefe, just as a rem reminder of what her, some of her great work comes just a few years later, now taking a close up of a flower and just presenting it to us, uh, really confrontationally almost. Uh, Stieglitz photographs O'Keefe, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pictures through the 1920s. Uh, they marry and have a you know, long-term relationship until Stieglitz's death in 1946. Oops. Just get this slide. My apologies. It's an important one, too. Okay. Stieglitz, O'Keefe have Saturday evening dinners at a place called the Chinese Tea Garden in Columbus Circle in New York. Some of you know where that is. And every Saturday night, they would gather their friends, most of whom are artists, writers, critics, some of whom are, listed, are indicated here on this slide. And they discuss art, psychology, Freud, new, Jung, new, uh, the new music, the new, uh, the new, uh, the, the, the artists that are coming to, uh, that Stieglitz is bringing to, uh, from Europe to uh, America. Uh, but Blanche is brought by Robert, uh, excuse me, um, Waldo Frank, who I already mentioned. Uh, and Bloch is introduced to Stieglitz and the crew, I call it the crew, uh, for uh, 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 at one of these Saturday evening dinners. Now Bloch, as you know, is, is, believes that the soul of art is intuition and not uh, machine, uh, not the camera, not the machine. And he, he's very strong on will. Uh, he stated years later the following. He used to tell this story in his classes. This is Bloch in his classes at Berkeley uh, many years later. He said, at a dinner in New York, Bloch was given his, most, his, his host, Alfred Stieglitz, every, every reason why photography could not be considered an art. Why photographers, hence, could not be considered artists. And that's because of the beliefs that you now understand, hopefully. Uh, fine, said Stieglitz. Meet me at my gallery early Sunday morning and we'll photograph together. And they, met, they went forth with their Graphlex camera and tripod. They stopped at the lower midtown corner. His buildings and sky both seemed promising. Stieglitz set up his camera, focused it, and took a picture. Then he changed plates and without repositioning the camera, told Bach it was his turn. <laughs> Stieglitz timed the exposure identically. They returned to the studio and each developed his plate exactly the same. Blake Block saw at once that a cityscape, cityscape was drab and lifeless, capturing none of the luster he saw in Stieglitz's. But how can this be, Block asked. Stieglitz said, it is because you do not love it, you do not believe in it. <laughs> now, is that the story correct? <clears throat> Block told the story many times in his classes, so what, I don't think he made up the whole thing, but it, you know, it could be be altered slightly. But the principle is there. Stieglitz transformed Bloch's understanding of photography's potential. And, and it was a good thing for Stieglitz because he was counting on a composer seeing photography as music, as you'll see. So Stieglitz worked hard at that. Well, the same year, uh, uh, excuse me, a couple years later in 1922, Stieglitz publishes a, a magazine called Manuscripts under the question, can a photograph have the significance of art? You might say, hold on, are they even worried about that question? Well, it was a burning question at the time, because uh, there's a machine involved. Uh, in 1922, Stieglitz sends out this uh, request to many, many people, artists, writers, composer Ernest Bloch, his friend, uh, uh, oh, really, all these people are his friends, uh, Ron Waldo Frank, who I mentioned already, and he invites them to make submissions to answer the question, can a photograph have the significance of art? And Waldo Frank sends a submission right away, January, probably only days after receiving the request. And just in a, in a, as briefly as I can, a year later, Stieglitz writes about this. Uh, and he says, Waldo Frank, one of America's young literary lights, wrote that he believed the secret power in my photography was due to the power of hypnotism. I and he goes on beyond hypnotism, but you get the point. It happened that the, the same morning, he goes on to say, that the same morning, his brother in law asked him why isn't he playing the piano anymore. So
So those two things, this is what Stieglitz says a year later. Uh, in addition to that, he, he decided to photograph, he began to photograph clouds. He wanted a true Waldo Frank wrong, basically. The clouds were free, no tax on them, to use his words. Uh, furthermore, Stieglitz decided to photograph clouds to show what he had learned in 40 years of photography yet by this point, to show his philosophy of life, photograph clouds, to get his philosophy of life. Uh, then he concludes that article with this description here, which is the one that is the reason we're probably here today, is this one quote. Uh, so I began to work with the clouds, and it was great excitement, daily for weeks. Every time I developed, I was so wrought up, always believing I had nearly gotten what I was after, but had failed. And, and a most tantalizing sequence of days and weeks, I knew exactly what I was after. I had told Miss O'Keefe I wanted a series of photographs which, when seen by Ernest Bach, the great composer, he would exclaim, music, music, man. Why, that is music. And he would, and, and how did you ever do that? And he would point to violins and flutes and oboes and brass and full of enthusiasm and say, he'd have to write a symphony called Clouds. Not like Debussy, but much, much more. And when finally I had my series of 10 photographs printed and Bloch saw them, what I said I wanted to happen, happened verbatim. <laughs> so the stamp of approval, the composer believes photography is an art. With that quote right there. Stieglitz had already converted Locke, but we didn't, you know, that, that's in the background. So just a few, not enough time to go through all ten, but this is number one of the series. You can see he's leaving a little landscape here. I mean, I don't know if that's a brass, or not brass, but a, let's say deep, deep strings or not, that dark sky. But there is a depth of richness, a depth, uh, I'll use the word depth there, that is different than a clear blue sky for sure. So you can see at least what he's trying to work with. Remember the word synesthesia now. Here, the last, these are what, the number uh, eight and nine of the series of ten. You can see, you know, the same hillside, if you look, you can see at just different moments in time. And he, literally printing them darker and lighter to create this variation of a feeling that he's associating with music. And then his last of the ten is this one where, yeah, I would say, it, it does feel finished here. There's a quietude to it compared to the previous two. So you can see what he's trying to do there. And so that's the series that Bach saw that called, that uh, he said, music. This is actually a letter that, uh, that uh, was found during my research. His daughter found it in his archives. And it was, lo and behold, a letter from Alfred Stieglitz thanking him. And here's Stieglitz and Bach about that time. My dear Mr. Bach, have you any idea how much it meant to me to have you feel about those photographs as you did, to have you see in them what you do? and to know that what you express I understand and feel is true. It was a memorable hour, a very rare one. So there's kind of a closure there on that, that, that experience from 1922 between the two. Now, Bloch did not write a symphony called Clouds. He was busy, busy, busy uh, doing other things, maybe smaller scale things, uh, uh, and uh, uh, was busy also directing the Cleveland Institute of Music, which he was the founding director in 1920. But by this time, his music had been played quite extensively, Boston, New York. Uh, really, he become, over a period, say, 1916 to 1920, really well known quickly in America, especially in the New York, Boston area, and was hired as a, uh, to uh, found the Cleveland Institute of Music. So things happened very quickly, and his music made it happen. But as I, as I see here on the slide, he did write a small piano piece that he orchestrated later titled uh, Poems of the Sea. Bloch, remember, had traveled the sea extensively, across the Atlantic twice by this time. Uh, so maybe he connected more to the waves than the clouds. So I put both with you. This is a Bloch picture of waves. You know, Bloch did respond to that same question in 1922, but by now, of course, he had been totally converted by Stiglitz. And uh, what we find is uh, that uh, his Bloch's response, here's a picture of uh, O'Keefe who designed the cover for you if you're interested. Uh, well, and I won't read every word here, but it does tell you a lot of what's happened from 1916 to 1922 with Bloch. He's talking about Stieglitz's photography now. By, what, by now, he's seen it in the gallery. He's seen quite a bit of Stieglitz's photography. And he says, besides the stupendous technique 
uh, chemical forces, transmutation and per perfections and weaknesses of material that the artistic hands. Every picture of Stieglitz embodies an idea and makes one think. It exceeds usual photography as far as a great artist exceeds a mechanical piano. So there's the machine. So you say, oh, it's beyond. It's like a, a great pianist. The dead camera and all other technical means are only tools in his hands. So see, he's been converted in his thinking now. There are pictures of hands so beautiful that one could cry before. There are pictures of skyscrapers, railway, and backyards that move you as if all the lives and tragedies of life connected with them were written clearly on their features. He has not only photographed things as they seem to be or as they appear to the bourgeois, he has taken them as they really are, an essence of their real life, and sometimes, sometimes accomplished the miracle of compelling them to reveal their own identity. Uh, and this is the greatest art because all signs of technique have disappeared for the sake of the idea. What a statement. That could be about any art, really. I mean, you just got it out of right. Unbelievable. Uh, but that's 1922 after seeing a lot of Stieglitz's photography. Well, back to Ernest Bloch photograph. There's one of many, many pictures of Alfred Stieglitz took of O'Keeffe's hands. And a couple of years later, 1922-23, he photographs his own hands. So something has happened this meeting Alfred Stieglitz, wouldn't you say? And it's a really wonderful portrait, self-portrait of the hands. And you put up the camera, set up the timer, put your hands on. Uh, meanwhile, lots of self-portraits of him staring at the camera. You've seen a few of those in the video uh, here in a kimono on the upper left. He did many stereo plates, by the way, which I don't have time to go into other than we'll show that one. Uh, and, but you can see if you look at the face on the bottom where he's under a lot of stress as a director of Cleveland Institute. And in the upper right, when he goes on vacation to uh, Nova Scotia and photographs himself with the, nat the native peoples, uh, you, you just look at the face on, uh, expression and you can really see all you need to see. He's much happier in, with, the, with the native people. So, but it's, it's just written literally on his face. Uh, he spends his summers out of Cleveland in the early 20s, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, uh, at a place called Peterborough, New Hampshire. There's a pond called Clearwater Pond. Uh, just a this is a chance to make a reference to what you're going to be hearing in a few minutes. During this period, a tremendous, uh, really uh, a, a significant amount of number of compositions, violin sonata, uh, uh, poems of the sea, Balsham, uh, sketches in sepia, uh, the, let me just, uh, from Jewish life, the three pieces that you will hear in a few minutes from Andrew, violin sonata number two, Concerto Brosa number one, which is pretty well known, on and on and on and on through this period of the 1920s. But he gets a Model T, too. <laughs> and he takes a picture, gets the camera, sets it up, takes a picture of the Model T at a distance. So it's the Model T, but it's in the environment, it's in the landscape. And here he is, a picture of himself, trying, sets it up. You've got to remember, that's what he's doing. He's really documenting his life. And here, uh, as at the, at the end of his tenure at the Cleveland Institute, he goes to Santa Fe, New Mexico, and the Southwest via train this time uh, uh, to compose, get away from the Cleveland Institute, basically, where he had been for four plus years. <laughs> Wonderful portrait of himself on the, cl the cliff of the Grand, uh, the edge of the Grand Canyon. Uh, Santa Fe, the La Fama Hotel, and then of course Native American. He goes up to Taos and just this response, the authenticity of of the, the native people. San Francisco, so this is now a transition all the way to here, here in California, 1925. He becomes the founding director of the San Francisco Conservatory of Music. Uh, the uh, conservatory starts as a piano school and then he ends up being uh, the director that expands it into a full-blown full -blown, uh, conservatory. Uh, he actually uh, composed in 1925 uh, a piece, a uh, rather large piece called America. It's a symphony about America. This is also the same year he regained citizenship, uh, a, a U.S. citizenship. And he, uh, you can see it here, I've uh, quoted a little bit. I mean, he's this just absolute appreciation of America, this, this dedication to the memory of Abraham Lincoln and Walt Whitman and the vision, the ideals of America are imperishable. 
Um, and he really had a great, great appreciation for what America gave him. And just the, now I'm going to warn you, there's a voice here, there's his voice, just a few seconds of him talking about the Symphony of America should come up. I had the idea of the Symphony of America before a landing in August 1960. Europe was at war. I came to America and it was like another planet. It took me 10 years before I wrote the Symphony. I had to absorb America. And then the music came. Uh, now we're coming finally to the composition of the Sacred Service. Believe it or not, we're getting there. Um, uh, this picture, by the way, was right at the end of his tenure as a uh, at the San Francisco Mus uh, Conservatory of Music as director, and it's a wonderful portrait by Dorothea Lange. You, some of you photography people will recognize that name, and some of you others may as well uh, may also. Uh, but she did some wonderful portraits, and this one of Block in 1929 is really captures his intensity. You heard it in the voice. It's right there, too, I think. Uh, in any case, you've already learned a little bit about what the, 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 this the storyline of what happens with, the, uh, with the, for, the formation and the composition of the sacred service. So he, com he returns to Switzerland. He gets a stipend to actually uh, compose the sacred service. Uh, uh, the summer before that, he goes to Switzerland, maybe uh, just get back to his home country for a vacation in the summer of 29, and ma makes this picture he titled The Lonely Tree. It's one of the few pictures, maybe the only one that I know of, that actually had enlarged large, uh, because he felt it to be a self-portrait. His daughter, I remember, told me adamantly he felt this lonely tree was a picture of him, not as much as, 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 much as it is a tree, he titled it The Lonely Tree, this kind of isolation against the storms. So that's how Ernest Bloch thought of himself right there. Um, sacred service, um, uh, most people don't know that he spent the first year or close to a year studying Hebrew before he actually began to compose the sacred service. So he didn't grow up learning Hebrew. He learned it on his own as before he composed the sacred service uh, during the 1930s, let's see if I can. Oops, I knew that would happen. It's a little tricky.
chestnuts especially, and several people were enthusiastic about them in Paris, which is interesting. I wonder if I should expose, which I guess meant to name's exhibit. He never did. All that with a Leica. He was an avid Leica user when it was invented in the late 20s. Uh, and this size, he writes that on the letter, and larger, which was a new thing at the time. And I had only a few uh, printed as I made over 1,000 negatives since a year. Some portraits, too. Very extraordinary. So he was a very enthusiastic photographer in the mountains of and um, he was uh, unique, there's no question about it. To have a composer take pictures, it's, 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 I think it's one of a kind. Uh, he continues to stay in Europe, uh, in, in the, the Alps, actually, in the French Alps now, in the latter part of the 30s. Just thought, piano sonata, voice in the wilderness for cello and orchestra, really quite a big piece that he did, uh, and a number of other pieces he composes. He has visitors that come and visit him. Uh, Yehudi Menuhin, a young Yehudi Menuhin on the left, and of course Alexander Bajansky, the cellist, later in life, uh, here on the right. Uh, war is beginning, Germany invades Poland, 1939. Leaving back to the United States again. But in the last 20 years of his life, he settles in Agate Beach near Newport, Oregon, um, which is, of course, the connection I have, because that's where I'm from. And I ended up... Uh, connecting with it there. But here he is uh, at Agate Beach. Uh, his favorite quote from Walt Whitman from Leaves of Grass, give me solitude, give me nature, give me again, oh nature, your primal sanities. Mm -hmm. That is his favorite quote from Walt Whitman. Uh, just so you can see what he looked like, here he is with his camera, like him on a tripod, and they left it later. He died in 59, so this is in the last you know, few years. Here he is picking agates off of Agate Beach, box of agates on the lower right. He's walking extensively on me. He continues to compose up to his death in 1959, extensively. Uh, and uh, quite uh, remarkably, right up to the, right up to the end. Uh, these are the people I want to thank, though, and that's his daughter, Lucian, on the left. The picture I took when she was imitating the mushroom table. And then Suzanne, the uh, 
uh, teacher of the lute at Juilliard, who was kind enough to introduce me to uh, that school, and here she is a, pic uh, uh, a picture of uh, her at an exhibit we had in New York of the prints that I made from her father's negatives, and then of course the uh, picture of his son, who I met as well. He was uh, in Oregon, one thing led to another, and uh, they opened up their arms to me, and uh, as a 21-year-old undergraduate, so it's that family that said, this photography, somebody, and then I show up. There I am. Uh, <laughs> taking pictures of clouds. <laughs> so I, that age where you can throw yourself completely into something, there's nothing to stop you. And that's what happened. And finally, uh, what you've seen is an immigrant story. Uh, a story of the hope that America represented to really the whole world, but certainly to him. Here you, again, you recognize the picture on the left in New York, and of course this is one of his pictures of Agon Teach in the last few years of his life. And I'll just close with some of his own words, also referring to his Symphony America, uh, just about what America meant. Now you see, this symphony is yours too. I hope I wrote a good work that you may come at the end and sing it with us, with the orchestra, with much more than music. A kind of heart, giving your heart to a great country in faith, not only in what we know, but in what has to come and can come. And it's that to the whole of humanity, of no discrimination, of unity, of different things, different races. Different tongues, all that, all coming together. That is America. <laughs> Thank you.